Thank you. Thanks very much for coming. It's a beautiful theater. I'm really uh, honored to be here. And thanks um, to Dean Ray and to Susan for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, and to everybody at MSU and the Center for Western Lands and Peoples who made this whole thing happen. So how many of you out here have read any of the little house books or seen the TV show? <laughs> yeah, quite a, quite a few. Um, and, and it kind of never fails. And, and uh, I too read these books uh, as a kid, as, as I assume many of you did, um, and always had a sense that they were in some way uh, about my family. Uh, because all of my grandparents um, were Midwest farming people from Wisconsin and Minnesota and the Dakotas. Um, and I was always hearing stories from them about you know, how hard the life was. Uh, and so I was curious about that. I, 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 was, I, I think even as a kid, I saw the discrepancy between um, the books and what my grandparents were telling me because they were a little bit harsher in a lot of ways than, than Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, and so I always had this kind of germ of an idea that there was more to the story that, than I was getting. Um, so I'm gonna show you some, some slides, but first I thought I'd talk uh, a little bit about Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, as an American icon you know, how she got that way, uh, and what it is about her work that leads, um, that, that kind of lends itself to the mythologizing of her life story. And then we'll go through these, these slides that illustrate her life and that process. Um, so who was Laura Ingalls Wilder? Well, she was born in uh, 1867 in Pepin, Wisconsin, uh, a couple years after the end of the Civil War, and she lives until 1957, which is the Eisenhower administration. Uh, so a very, very long uh, life that encompassed all kinds of, of major historical moments, including uh, the Great Plains Wars, uh, Indian Wars, the uh, homesteading movement, um, and ultimately the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. Um, and she starts writing about her life and her childhood when she's in her 60s. Um, so she has become, I think, our most recognizable frontier figure, which you can, of course, trace to her books. You know, generations of school children read them or had them read to them. Many of you probably had that experience. Um, and then the TV show had this huge impact, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But it is remarkable, I think, that she has become so recognizable, such a kind of icon of the frontier, because of course, in previous decades, the recognizable frontier icons were all men. And I'm thinking primarily of folks like Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. Uh, both of them were real people, of course. Both of them had 1950s era TV shows made about them. Um, and on TV for a while, they were played by the same guy, Fess Parker, um, which may have contributed to the fact that in my childish mind, they were the same guy who had kind of a raccoon on his head because um, he wore this coonskin cap. Uh, and, and these shows, you can still see them on, on some channels. Very weird shows to see now because they're kind of uh, an encyclopedia of stereotypes <laughs> almost. Um, but neither Boone nor, nor Crockett were known for their writing and I think probably in a lot of ways that contributed to their falling into disrepair as icons. And so Wilder has gradually taken their place. Uh, and so our icon of the frontier is now uh, not only female, but a child, uh, because it's through the fictional Laura that we experience these stories. And that's critical, because it has always been very difficult for readers 
and consumers of the Little House universe to kind of distinguish between the Laura of the books and the real Laura Ingalls Wilder. And that was a confusion that she fostered uh, because the books are told. She told these stories about herself in the third person. They're about Laura Ingalls, and the author is Laura Ingalls Wilder. So everybody has naturally assumed that the books were autobiographical, if not pure autobiography, and it hasn't been easy to figure out what was real and what wasn't. And in fact, before she wrote the novels, Wilder had written a memoir that did expose more of the true story uh, from her first 18 years of life, but it was never published until just a few years ago. Uh, it's called Pioneer Girl, um, and many of you have probably seen it. Uh, the memoir it was published in 2014 and almost instantly became a big bestseller uh, because there was such a curiosity about who was the real Laura. But of course, Pioneer Girl only covers her life until the day she gets married, just like the novels. Uh, and there were reasons for that. But another thing that's important and that I think you should know is that Wilder didn't mind that readers thought that her novels were true. She knew they were fictionalized, but she encouraged people to, th to think that they were, as she called it, all true. And so did her daughter, the journalist whose name was Rose Wilder Lane, who was her secret editor and who colluded with her in this. And the fact that Wilder wanted people to think that these stories were true is really important. She wanted people to see her family as successful. Uh, not necessarily, you know, in a material sense. Obviously, they were poor. But she portrayed them as stable and secure and as having reached a place where they didn't really have to, you know, necessarily worry about where their next meal was coming from. Um, and in fact, that wasn't really true. They never got to that place. Uh, in fact, one of the saddest scenes, I think, in, in Prairie Fires is when Charles Ingalls, Laura's father, dies, and he's so poor that the family can't pay for his medical bills or for his funeral expenses. And his wife and his daughter Mary, who was blind, were left penniless at his death. And their struggle never really ceased. But Wilder wanted to portray her family in the best possible light. So she didn't want to admit what a struggle their lives were. And the books, even though they're full of, of uh, adventures and, and sort of terrifying encounters with natural disaster, they all end happily. And they suggest that the family was better off than they were. And that has been enormously influential in the way that people think about the history that's covered in the books. So I think this shows us that we have a real tendency to mythologize our past, the stories that we tell uh, about ourselves, the stories that make us look good. Some scholars call this national biography, and, and it's, they're not talking about books or actual biographies, but, but about this habit that we have of making myths out of our founding fathers and our folk heroes. Um, Hamilton is a really good example of this, I think. On the one hand, you've got Ron Chernow's massive uh, biography, um, and then uh, you have uh, somebody make uh, an extraordinarily successful and popular stage play out of that. So, um, you know, who who is going to remember which version? You know, are we going to remember the big doorstopper biography or the songs by Lin Manuel Miranda? I mean, it's a it's a really interesting um, issue, and if you think about it. Laura Ingalls Wilder is all about what one writer has called the denial of history. It's all about kind of leaving things out. Uh, and this is the part, um, this is part of how she helps us see ourselves as mythic. 
Her stories are wonderful. I, I still love them. Uh, I can get drawn into them, reading them at any point. But the stuff that she left out is as dramatic, if not more dramatic, than what she, she left in. So that's what I'm going to be talking about as we look at these photos now. Um, and that's why I have this sort of truth versus fiction thing up here. Um, the first group of photos we're going to look at uh, is uh, about the truth, um, <laughs> the historical ground truth of her life, the reality. Um, and then later I'll, I'll show you a group that represents the fiction uh, that she made of it and that other people subsequently made of it. Um, and how that has become part of this very influential mythology about homesteading and farming and our ideas about white settlement. Was it a success? And for whom was it a success? These are complicated issues and that's a lot of what Prairie Fires is about. Um, so because these are tales written for children, they're presented in a kind of historical Vacuum, You know, Little House on the Prairie uh, opens with a, an assertion that, that the family has come to this prairie and it's open and no one is there. And it's kind of a tabula rasa. You know, nobody uh, is, is in sight. And she uh, makes it sound kind of like um, they're the first people to ever see it. Uh, but of course, they were in Kansas, you know, which was called bleeding Kansas for a reason, um, had all kinds of history, all kinds of people had uh, been there. So the books are a little bit like fairy tales. Um, Wilder doesn't say what has been happening on the frontier. Uh, she doesn't explain what was happening in Wisconsin when she was born there, um, or what's happening in Kansas in Little House on the Prairie. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, this is Little Crow, uh, and he has a direct connection to the Little House books because uh, he was part of an event called what Wilder called the Minnesota Massacre. It's more correctly called now the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. Now this happens five years before Laura is born, but it's in, in it's hard to to overestimate how important this is uh, because she refers often to the Minnesota massacre in Little House on the Prairie and she never explains what it is. <laughs> she just leaves you to imagine. She wants to suggest the fear that's behind it without saying what it actually is. What it was, was an event in Minnesota. Um, this man was the leader of a small band of uh, Dakota warriors um, who were very aggrieved at the situation that they found themselves in. Uh, they were the victims of a, of a number of very uh, misleading and, and bad treaties. And he ultimately, while he didn't want to go to war, he ultimately was kind of manipulated into this situation and forced into it. Uh, he had been to Washington, D.C. on a couple of occasions. This photo was taken in Washington, D.C., where he went to try to negotiate with the president. So because he'd been on these journeys, he had seen how many white people already covered uh, the country. So he knew that there was no possibility of winning a war against uh, the U.S. government. Um, but his, his soldiers really took the decision away from him. They attacked some farmers. Uh, one day, and ultimately they decided to just proceed with this war. Um, they attacked uh, farmers, settlers, one hot day in August in 1862, um, and over the course of two days killed some 600 men, women, and children. And the cost of that would be uh, quite significant for everybody uh, on the frontier. Um, I'm not going to tell you much more about it. There's a short uh, passage about it in the book, but I just thought I'd show you this map of Minnesota. You see Min Minneapolis and St. Paul. 
uh, over on the right, and in the bottom there's a place called Lake Shedek. Um, one of the massacres that was quite severe took place at Lake Shedek, and when the Ingalls family moved to Minnesota, they lived only 10 miles from that place, and they saw the foundations of homes and of chimneys that had been burned out. Um, this was the kind of coverage uh, nationally of this event. Uh, this is from Harper's Illustrated. Um, it shows uh, settlers uh, lying dead on the ground in the, in the foreground. You see a child impaled on a tree limb uh, in the back. Um, this was the kind of thing that was published everywhere. Um, and so it shows that, that white settlement was uh, not good for everybody. There were, um, there were terrible things happening on the prairie just before she was born. And so who was consuming these images? Uh, this couple would have been one of the people who probably saw things like this. This is Charles and Caroline Ingalls, their wedding photo from 1860. Um, and here is a photo of them taken a few years later. Uh, I've always really liked this photo because uh, as those of you who remember the, the little house books know that Laura often described her father with wild hair. You can really see that in this photo. Um, he was a very literate man. He, he cared about books. He had books. Uh, he had a lot of photographs taken of his family. Um, we actually have more photos of the Ingalls than we do later of the Wilders. Um, and we have this famous photo of the Ingalls girls. Uh, Carrie on the left and Mary seated, and then Laura standing on the right. This is the only photo of uh, the Ingalls girls um, from their childhood. And it's an interesting kind of intersection between fiction and reality because they very much uh, kind of resemble the descriptions that, that uh, Wilder would, would write years later. Carrie was always described as frail. She looks frail in this photo. Mary was always the patient, pious one uh, with her hands folded in her lap. And Laura, you can see, was really kind of um, a different animal altogether. She's, she's standing there, she's fierce. She has her um, hands uh, in, in fists uh, and, and is looking um, off in the distance. And so I think this does in, in fact reflect something about their personalities. But we don't have any photographs that document the reality of their lives. You know, there are no casual snapshots of their covered wagon journeys. Um, there are only things like this. Uh, so, uh, so I just included a couple of things just to show you um, how tough, you know, this life was. I think this gives a very different sense of the descriptions uh, in the books. These people probably just have the clothes they're standing up in. Um, when Wilder wrote about the prairie, she often talked about how clean it was, the beautiful, clean grassland, uh, but it must have been a real struggle to stay clean in these conditions. Here's another uh, photo of another family. Um, and I think it also gives you a sense that people who were as poor as these people were um, probably couldn't keep a lot of things, letters, family letters, diaries. It was very hard to hang on to possessions when you had so much upheaval uh, in your life. Um, and among the, the most terrifying catastrophes that are described in the Little House books um, and that were faced by the Ingalls was the uh, grasshopper invasion, the locust invasion of the 1870s. We also don't have any images of this. This is a, um, another Harper's Illustrated uh, thing showing these, these great swarms of locusts stopping a train. Um, and this is what farmers looked like once the uh, locusts were done with them. 
Um, and this would have been Charles Engel's situation, essentially, because he was, in fact, forced to accept some very small form of government relief, and the family eventually became uh, kind of homeless, uh, ended up wandering over to Iowa and then back to Minnesota. Um, so again, uh, white settlement was, was a very marginal enterprise at the time. Um, and to give you an idea of what the housing looked like, this is a photograph of a tar paper shanty. This is actually Carrie Ingalls uh, standing by her tar paper shanty in South Dakota in 1907. Uh, but this would have been like the houses, many of the houses that the Ingalls would have lived in. Um, so Laura, when they go back to uh, South Dakota to Smet, it's really Dakota territory in 1884, she goes to high school. She has ambitions to be a writer even then. She wrote an essay called Ambition, which she saved th for the rest of her life. But she didn't have really an opportunity to act on it because she very quickly married uh, this man, Elmanzo Wilder. This is the honeymoon photo uh, for the Wilders. Um, she was engaged at 17, married at 18, and by the age of 19, she had had her first child, Rose, um, who would unfortunately have a kind of a traumatic childhood. She apparently had sort of a battle with the photographer uh, in taking this photo because she had a ring on her finger that she wanted prominently displayed in the photo. And he kept trying to put that hand behind the other hand and she moved it, um, which is an interesting story given her, her later struggles with authority. Um, but this is where she was born. This is the Wilder homestead that's just north uh, of the town of Desmet, South Dakota. And on this marker um, at the bottom, there's a quote from Wilder saying, no one who has not pioneered can understand the fascination or the terror of it. And she had good reason to know the terror uh, over the next few years because almost as soon as they got married, um, they started losing crops to hail, to drought, to hot winds. Uh, there were prairie fires. Um, they went heavily into debt because of these crop losses. Uh, and then they fell ill with diphtheria, Laura and Almanzo. And they recovered, but during their recovery, Almanzo uh, suffered a stroke uh, and was left with a permanent disability. Um, and this was bad enough, but then after that, uh, as they were struggling to figure out what they were gonna do, how they were gonna continue to farm, um, they were trying to pay off their debts. Um, they, she became pregnant, had another child who died about a month after he was born. And then within a few weeks, their house burned down. Uh, and that was really the end of any hope that they had of being able to stay in this place. They realized that because of his condition, they were gonna have to go elsewhere. So they moved around a lot. Eventually, they decided to go to the Ozarks uh, in Southwest Missouri. And this is the last family photo of the Ingalls family before they left. And I think it's a really interesting photograph. You've got Caroline and Charles Ingalls and Mary seated in front, uh, and Carrie standing behind her mother, Laura behind her father, and Grace uh, with Mary. Um, but Almanzo and Rose are not included in this photograph, and Laura is standing with her hand on her father's shoulder. Um, and I think that her separation from the family uh, and her father may have ultimately been the real inspiration behind the little house books. It's not that she didn't love her husband or her daughter, she did, 
but I don't think she was ever really able to recreate uh, the closeness that she had with her original family growing up. And that may in part have been because of her difficult relationship with her daughter. So they travel 700 miles south. This is Almanzo in, his, uh, in the wagon that they drove there with his Morgan horses <laughs> and his buffalo robe uh, coat. Uh, and in the right hand side, you see the corner of a building. And that was actually on the property that they bought uh, outside of Mansfield. It was a windowless log cabin, um, very primitive. Uh, and they survived that first winter by cutting down some of the trees on the 40 acres that they bought and selling it as firewood. Uh, and life there was so tough that they eventually, within a couple of years, ended up moving into the town of Mansfield. They leased their farmland rented a house. This is Laura standing on the porch of that house. I think she was kind of embarrassed by this photo because she wrote on the back, just as I am without one plea. <laughs> and and uh, she's just wearing her apron. Um, but Rose eventually graduates from high school. Uh, here's her high school photo. And almost immediately she hops on a train and goes to Kansas City to become a telegrapher. And here's Rose in the big city, um, looking very pleased with herself, part of this movement of young uh, bachelor women, working girls in the, in the early part of the 1900s. Um, and of course, her mother goes to visit her in Kansas City. And look at the transformation that has happened between the woman who was standing on the porch in her apron, uh, embarrassed, and this woman who is completely glamorous and has a fancy hat and a, a fur wrap. Um, this is the moment at which she starts to become a really uh, professional woman, a sort of force to be reckoned with. She joins all these women's clubs and farm clubs, um, visits her daughter, uh, back home, she and Almanzo have been able to save some money and they start working on this beautiful farmhouse uh, on their property. They call it Rocky Ridge and it becomes kind of a show place. Uh, and they start adding to their property. Eventually they have a couple of hundred acres. And over the course of time, uh, Rose follows her boyfriend to San Francisco um, Laura decides that she wants to visit her daughter in San Francisco in 1915 in order to see the Panama Pacific Exhibition. Exposition, it's, it's the World's Fair celebrating the rebirth of San Francisco after the earthquake. Rose has married this fellow who's really kind of a traveling salesman, um, the kind of guy that her parents warned her about. His name is Claire Gillette Lane. Uh, and she starts writing for newspapers, such as the San Francisco Call. Um, and these newspapers were all pretty heavily influenced by William Randolph Hearst, who got his start in San Francisco. And you can see that by the use of, you know, fancy photography, the framing of the photographs. Um, this is one of Rose's first articles. Um, and it, it shows the influence of, of yellow journalism in positive and negative ways, because although we associate it with sensationalism, uh, that movement also brought women into the newsroom for the first time. Um, and here's a photo of Laura and her son-in-law, Claire Gillette Lane in the Muir Woods. Uh, she's having a fantastic time going to see all the sites, um, going to the World's Fair. Uh, and this is one of the things she saw and described in letters that she wrote home to Almanzo. This is the Pioneer Woman, a statue that was uh, put on display uh, at the World's Fair. It's still in Golden Gate Park. Um, and as I say in the book, it's, it's almost like a monument 
to herself because she was this woman and she was very fascinated by the woman's shoe. You could see the underside of it and she felt that it looked like it had been resold. Um, so Laura is at this point in San Francisco uh, apprenticing herself to her daughter in the news business. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that Rose was writing. <laughs> this is Ed Monroe Manhunter, the life story of a real detective. It was actually based not on a real detective, but on a former jewel thief. Um, and this was the kind of thing that, that Rose excelled at. She started writing all these celebrity biographies. She wrote a fake autobiography of Charlie Chaplin. Um, so this is, is, you know, I mean, you might call it the real fake news, um, but it's the kind of thing that, that Laura is learning, and, and it's an interesting connection between this sort of fake autobiography and, you know, what's, what are the two of them going to work on years later, uh, another kind of fictionalized autobiography. So back home, Laura sets herself to make some money by writing and succeeds beyond her wildest dreams. This is an ad for a very popular farm newspaper, the Missouri Ruralist, uh, which lists the contributions of Mrs. A.J. Wilder. Um, she became a very popular columnist for them, worked for, for the Ruralist for about 10 years. Uh, meanwhile, her daughter is traveling the world. Oh, this is Laura. Uh, at the time when she was writing for the Ruralist, it's a publicity photo, and Rose was traveling at this period. She went overseas for the Red Cross. She wrote all this travel journalism. Here she is in France. Um, but she keeps coming home. This is a, a photo of her um, not long after she had shaved her head. Um, and, and this is, is kind of the period when she begins to suffer from episodes of depression. Uh, and, and I think that the head shaving had something to do with the, that. I mean, it's the kind of thing that if you did it now, nobody would uh, blink an eye. But um, in the 1920s in uh, a remote town in rural Missouri, you can bet that somebody blinked an eye. Um, and one of the uh, sort of outlandish things she does in this period is build another house for her parents. This is the rock house, and, and Laura and Almanzo and a friend of theirs are standing in front of it on the day that they move in uh, at the end of 1928. Um, this is a more contemporary view uh, of the house. It was built from a Sears kit, um, but Rose couldn't uh, sort of control her spending on it. She kept redesigning things and adding things. And by the end, she had spent something like $11,000 uh, on this house, which uh, at that time was real money. Um, and unfortunately, it was a spectacularly ill-timed investment because what was about to happen uh, at the end of 1929, the stock market crashes. Rose loses a great deal of money in the crash. She had also urged her parents to invest. Uh, so they lost that money as well. Um, here is uh, an image of some of the rolling dusters that began to be seen around that time. And Rose and her parents have a kind of front row seat to this whole thing because all that dust that's blowing out of Oklahoma and Texas, a lot of it is blowing into Missouri, which has terrible heat waves at this time. And all of this, I think, makes Laura very concerned uh, about their situation because she has recently retired. She's quit her money-making jobs. Uh, and Rose has borrowed a lot of money from a local bank. So she's concerned, uh, as the Dust Bowl sets in, um, that they might uh, even lose their property. So, so Laura sets her sights on trying to write this memoir. The idea is to sell it to somebody in New York, to a magazine, as a serial. 
Uh, and so the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression will become kind of visible in her writing. This whole idea of bootstrapping, of kind of you know, lifting yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, celebrating self-reliance, uh, comes into play at this time. And here are, uh, here we are at the moment when all of her life is going to become fictionalized. And these are the tablets that she wrote on, the Big Chief and 5050 Dime Store tablets. Um, it's been a real uh, struggle to preserve these because the quality of the paper is apparently so poor uh, that they become really brittle. Um, they've told me that the paper that was used in the Civil War was much better than this paper because it had a higher rag content. And so she writes this memoir. She fills tablet after tablet, but it doesn't sell. Um, so Rose writes a short version. She takes chunks of this, uh, writes a little version as a picture book for children, and sends it to an editor in New York. And the editor likes it, but says, I don't, I don't want a picture book. I don't think this should be for younger children. I want something longer for older kids. Um, she wants 26,000 words. So Rose tells her mother this, and Laura sits down and fills a few more tablets. And that brings us to her first book, Little House in the Big Woods, uh, published in 1932. And look at the house here and think of the tar paper shanties and so forth that they would have lived in. It's a, it's a much kind of warmer, cozier vision uh, of their lives than the reality would have been. Um, and this does really, really well. It sells really well during the Depression. This is the, it's a beautifully produced book. This is the color frontispiece. Uh, about the, the little story where um, Pa is away and so Ma takes Laura out to feed the cow and she sees an animal in the paddock and gives it a big slap on the rump and it turns out to be a bear. Um, this is another illustration that I really love from the first edition of the wolves that look like shaggy dogs. And you can see how much this resembles a kind of fairy tale. But in the wake of her mother's success, I mean, Laura is thrilled at how well this book does. But Rose sees this and does something very fateful. She sees um, uh, how well this is doing, and she decides to write her own novel based on her mother's material. She doesn't tell her mother uh, and this is the resulting book, Let the Hurricane Roar, which also did very well, but Laura found out about it in the worst possible way, through an ad just like this, the Publishers Weekly, um, and discovered that Rose had used the actual names of her parents, Charles and Caroline, and she was horrified. And this caused a real rift between them uh, that would last for some years. And soon after this happens, Rose moves away finally from the farm. And almost as soon as she leaves the farmhouse, the Wilders move back into it <laughs> and leave the other house behind. Um, but Laura presses on. This is her fourth book on the banks of Plum Creek. And you'll note at the top that it says the true story of an American pioneer family. And this is the period in which she really kind of doubles down on this idea that everything in the books is true. Um, and she does this by giving a speech at the Hudson's department store in Detroit. She travels there, they take a road trip, um, and she gives this amazing speech uh, in Detroit, even though she's very intimidated by appearing in this place. She said it made her feel like a hillbilly. Um, but she gives this wonderful talk. This is the little pamphlet from uh, the book fair. And in it she says, I realized I had seen and lived it all. All the successive phases of the frontier, 
first the frontiersmen, then the pioneer, then the farmers and the towns. I understood that in my own life, I represented a whole period of American history. And of course she did. And soon enough, she finishes the series by 1943. Probably many of you here read one of these uh, versions in the back are the old uh, original editions illustrated by Helen Sewell. And then there's the yellow paperbacks that I read in the 70s and the blue uh, paperbacks as well. Um, and Rose, meanwhile, has moved back east to Connecticut. She's become a kind of political activist uh, and an isolationist. Here she is testifying before Congress uh, in 1939 against the U.S. entering the war. Um, and she is really well on her way to developing this libertarian philosophy that she'll become known for. Uh, she never sees her father again after she leaves home, refuses to come home to visit. Um, but the Wilders, I think, in this last period of their lives are really fairly content. They are, for the first time, uh, secure, um, well off. They, they're earning money from her books. Uh, this is Almanzo and Laura standing in front of Rocky Ridge with some of the many visitors who were coming to see them. A um, lot of school kids were finding out where they lived. Uh, Almanzo dies in 1949, and Laura lives, of course, until 1957. And almost as soon as she has passed, the house begins uh, to be made over into a museum, which it still is today. And so many people were interested in traveling to all these sites that it became a kind of pilgrimage. You know, you can see all the places where the Ingalls family had lived, where Laura was born in Wisconsin, uh, Walnut Grove, Minnesota, DeSmet, um, and of course the house in Mansfield. Um, and because most of the houses had been lost in the interim, people just recreated them. This is the recreation of the little house on the prairie, which I think was recently rebuilt. This is south of Independence, Kansas. Um, near DeSmet, the Ingalls homestead property is now uh, Laura's Living Prairie, and you can ride in a covered wagon um, <laughs> and see all these buildings that have been reconstructed to kind of recreate the experience of the town, which of course is still there and has many of the, the original buildings, but you know, there's a barn and um, a school house and, and, uh, and so forth. Um, but of course the most famous fictional adaptation was the television show uh, based on Little House on the Prairie. Um, note the house in the background, which is a two-story home uh, with a very, uh, those of you who remember the show will recall the fireplace inside, which is this, this sort of enormous baronial stone <laughs> fireplace. And this is because Michael Landon apparently uh, objected to having his TV family look poor. He wanted his kids to have nice shoes and dolls and so forth. Um, and of course he had his own idea of what Pa <laughs> looked like. Um, so the TV show was really, I think, more about the 1970s than it was about the 1870s. Um, Landon actually got in, a, in an argument with the original producer of the show, uh, Ed Friendly, because um, Ed Friendly disliked how he had made the show so much about himself. Um, but Ed Friendly thought that, that it should, the show should be renamed, How Affluent Is My Prairie? <laughs> so, so the whole TV show came about uh, largely because of this man, Roger McBride. Um, he inherited the Wilder estate. 
uh, through a sort of very unusual series of circumstances because Rose had died in 1968, but, but in her later life, she'd had this kind of habit of, of sort of informally adopting uh, teenagers. Um, and he was one of, I mean, he had his own parents, but she sort of adopted him as her uh, adopted grandson, and he became her political and literal uh, heir. And so she left the estate to him. He never knew Laura, uh, but he was uh, the fellow who ended up selling the rights uh, of her work to a TV producer. Um, he had real political ambitions. Uh, he had served in the Vermont State House, and he ultimately ran for president as a libertarian in 1976. Uh, he was involved in the founding of the Libertarian Party, um, along with the Koch brothers, uh, who were active in that at that time. He also had a you know just profound effect on the Wilder legacy. He, in addition to the TV show, he also wrote a number of sequels about Rose um, and prequels and so forth. Uh, and so the, the afterlife of the Little House books has, has been tremendously uh, interesting to follow. Um, this is a photograph of the Walnut Grove pageant, which is put on every summer uh, in Walnut Grove, Minnesota. They have a recreation of a prairie fire, <laughs> which you see here in the foreground. Um, this is uh, Butter Laura, who was <laughs> carved at the uh, Iowa State Fair last summer um, in a tribute uh, to her. And lately there has been a real uh, fashion movement um, of, of prairie chic, it's called, in the New York Times. Uh, this has been, and some other uh, related fashions have been featured, um, which I believe are very much inspired in part by Laura Ingalls Wilder. And, and it's just this image of a kind of um, virtuous, uh, you know, uncomplicated, this, this notion of a time um, when there was some greater kind of, of purity or simplicity to life. I'm not sure that that was really true, but I think that's, you know, how people perceive it. Um, and there's now a line of uh, fabrics, Little House on the Prairie fabrics with covered wagons and wheat and they have forgotten the grasshoppers, I think, <laughs> unfortunately. And when I um, went to look for grasshopper fabric, I had to go further afield. But um, finally, here is the design for the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award by Garth Williams. Garth Williams, the, the illustrator of the 1950s edition, designed this award for the American Library Association. And many of you have probably heard uh, that earlier this year, the um, part of the Library Association, the children's um, chapter of it, uh, took the decision to remove Wilder's name from this award uh, because of the stereotypes in the books. Um, I've always thought it's interesting that the award does not, even though it's called Laura Ingalls Wilder Award, doesn't feature a picture of her, of the author. It features a picture of Laura, the child. Um, so the whole idea behind Prairie Fires was really to kind of cut against the myth-making uh, of the fiction and, and explore who Laura really was, what her life was really like. Because in many ways, I think her life was, was deeper and, and more difficult um, than we ever knew. She used to sing this, this song in her uh, earlier life as a farmer um, called Don't Leave the Farm, Boys. Uh, and it had this line, there's gold in the farm, if only you'll shovel it out. But for her, the gold was in books, not crops. And that's the real story behind Prairie Fires. So thank you very much.
we're going to have time for questions. And there's a couple of folks with uh, microphones, so if you want to just raise your hand, or um, there's a woman over here. You started to describe her life before her daughter went to um, California, and it sounded like they were very poor and almost in um, destitute. And then all of a sudden, they were doing well. Mm. What happened there? Um, you know, they didn't have a great deal of money when they built that house. And I think, you know, you're... Uh, you're right to question that, but I think I compressed a number of events into too short a period of time. But um, they worked on that house for many, many years, and so they would save money. Um, they had a number of odd jobs. El Manzo was the uh, kind of dray man. He, he delivered freight at the railway. Um, Laura took in borders cooked meals for, for train travelers because that house uh, that was, uh, you saw her standing on the porch, was right next to the train tracks. Um, so they had all these little odd jobs. Um, Laura eventually started writing for the ruralist and worked also as the secretary treasurer for the Federal Farm Loan uh, Bureau in Mansfield. So they were earning money bit by bit and saving it um, and ended up, you know, being able to construct that house, but it did take quite a long time for them to finish it. They kept adding on to it um, as time went by. So it actually didn't represent a, a huge financial outlay. I can't see very well from the lights, but is there anybody else who's got a question? I didn't really understand when you said the Laura Ingle Wilder Award, they removed the name Wilder and then they seemed to feel their or stereotypes that didn't want to be portrayed anymore, which I find ridiculous. But could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes. Subject? I, I think that they changed the name of the award to the children's Legacy, Children's Literature Legacy Award, or something like that. I may have that um, slightly wrong, but that was the, uh, the idea was to take her name off of the award because um, a number of children's librarians over a period of years have had uh, to deal with the issue of, of um, parents uh, complaining about uh, things that are in the books. And, and I think that this... You know, I mean, people feel quite strongly either way that, that it shouldn't have been done or that it should have been done. Um, I, th I tend to take the, the position that it's a good thing for us to have a conversation about because I do think that if the books are going to continue to be read by kids and taught in schools, that they probably need to be taught in a different way um, or presented in a different way. Uh, I think that a lot of uh, teachers used to just simply um, read the stories uh, without any explanation, for example, of the background or the history. Um, I think all those things are probably going to come into play. So. One of the specific stereotypes, that, what, what were the complaints? Well, in Little House on the Prairie, for example, um, which is a book that, you know, Laura called it her Indian country novel. And it contains many scenes in which Indians appear. And the phrase, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, is repeated three times. And that, I think, is, is the source of, of much, if not, not all, but much of the distress uh, about that book. Um, because reading that to... Uh, classrooms um, where there are Native American kids, you can imagine how people feel about that, how parents feel about that. Um, if you substitute, for example, the word Indians with just about any other 
you know, religion or race or uh, anything else, I think you can hear how upsetting that is. So that's one thing. There's another um, scene in Little Town on the prairie, which is a, a uh, blackface scene in which Pa and some of his, you know, townspeople uh, put on blackface face and have this minstrel program. That's another uh, issue. And, and they sing a song that has um, various racial epithets in it. Uh, and the, the editors were aware of this. They, they've been aware of it since the 1950s. And in fact, in the 1950s, they removed some of the words to that song because they realized uh, the power that, that it had to, to offend. So, you know, it's been a long time coming. They really have been talking about these issues for a long time. And, and I don't think it was just a... Um, something they just decided in a hurry because of, of the political climate or something like that. Is there somebody else? Oh. <laughs> there's, there's. So with that, with the, what she said in those books, mm -hmm. are those things true then? Then she grew up feeling that, or you know, hearing those things from her parents and from the people around her, or did she make those up? I mean, were those then true facts? They certainly were, and in fact, that phrase that I was just mentioning um, was inspired by uh, what she called the Minnesota Massacre, um, which was uh, so, shocking to people that it became, I mean, it was almost sort of like the 9-11 of its day, in a way. Um, and like a 9-11, it inspired uh, a reaction that was uh, itself truly horrific. Um, it inspired retaliatory massacres uh, of, um, against Indians by US government forces. So it's a very complicated uh, phrase, and it, while it is put in the mouths of characters who are not uh, the Ingalls family, and Charles Ingalls does criticize the use of that phrase, there are other things in that book that are not filtered um, in that way. There are descriptions of Indians as uh, dirty and thieving, um, and other things that uh, were certainly historically true in terms of the way people described Indians and thought of Indians. Um, so I'm not sure that the, the question is whether they were factually accurate. It's, it's more how you deal with that kind of material when you're teaching it to children. I think people often forget that that's who we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, reading these books and teaching them uh, to eight-year-olds. And so it's not a question of, you know, do you read a difficult text like Huck Finn, for example, in a college setting? Um, is that a problem? I mean, that's a completely different question. Uh, I think um, you have to consider that this is something that's being read and used in, in a context that involves very young children, and how do you deal with that in that situation? There's some. Hey, I grew up in the farmlands of Kansas and Missouri, and yet I was still shocked by uh, the politics that Laura took on Rose was mentally unstable, so Rose could have been influenced in any kind of uh, random direction, perhaps. But the starvation, the locusts, the fires, there were so many times when these people could not have worked any harder and there was no government help. Mm -hmm. There was the Dust Bowl and then FDR was horrifying to them. Uh, 
And I wondered if you could tell us on the eve of an election <laughs> um, more of your analysis of how their politics came to be. Yeah, yeah that's above my pay grade. I'm <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it is a, um, a fascinating moment because uh, you do see Laura Ingalls Wilder, who worked for the federal government, you know, for 10 years and thoroughly approved of the, the loan program that she was a part of, turn around and, and criticize uh, these New Deal programs that were helping her neighbors. Um, they didn't really, she was retired from farming by that time, so they didn't really affect her. But, but it is a really um, striking instance of that uh, kind of inability to, you know, to put yourself in another person's place. And, and I, this was by no means limited to her. I mean, it was a very common feeling among farmers in that area, uh, in rural Missouri, and, and among farmers in, in rural places all over America. Because on the one hand, many of them were accepting aid, and yet they also were, I think, terribly ashamed of it, and, and so felt compelled to criticize it. Um, and, you know, the sh I talk a little bit about the, the shame factor because I think it is so powerful. You know, we come from a people that preach self-reliance as part of their religion. You know, the Puritans were heavy into that. <laughs> and I think we've, in some ways, just never gotten over it. Um, and, and so much of our rhetoric is, is heaping scorn on those uh, who do accept help or who need help from the government. And yet, many of us accept that help in other ways. So it, it's, it's kind of a tragic flaw, I think, in, in her character, um, that reflects a, a wider flaw in the American character, in my view. Um, we'd like to thank you, Caroline, for thank coming you. this evening. And we do have um, a book signing in the front. Uh, so if you have a copy of the book or if you want to purchase a copy of the book, please join us in the lobby. And um, thank you so much. Thank and thank you. you, everyone, for coming. Oh, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Yeah.